Secret Lives of the Disabled is a podcast that illuminates what it's like to become physically disabled at some point during your lifetime in America by a catastrophic accident or chronic illness. My name is Sally Greenhouse. Let's enter into the secret lives of the disabled. On behalf of Forbes Library in Northampton, Massachusetts, I'm delighted to welcome you to a very special presentation. Forbes Library presents a preview of Secret Lives of the Disabled, a unique documentary podcast about becoming physically disabled in America, featuring performance artist Sally Greenhouse as interviewer, monologist, who is creator, writer, featured performer in the original long-running NCTV video series, The Greenhouse Effect. This project, awarded by the New England Foundation for the Arts under the aegis of their New Work New England program with an experimental grant in diversity, inclusivity, accessibility, has as its focus individuals facing permanent disability due to catastrophic accidents, auto collisions, chronic illnesses, debilitating pain, often plunging them into poverty, housing insecurity, insufficient access to groceries, inadequate social welfare, extreme isolation, while stigmatizing them as expendable members of American society, discriminated against despite the hard-won Americans with Disabilities Act. Especially of interest for library patrons is the podcast portion, since not only did Greenhouse win the New England Women in Video Award for Best Host on The Greenhouse Effect, with her unique interviews and monologues, for which she won the Artist Fellowship in Dramatic Writing from the Mass Cultural Council, her podcast of nationally renowned fiction and nonfiction writers as guests, with books available through the library system online, as well as in print, include Andre Dubuse III, author of newly released novel Such Kindness, Jason Kander, current political commentator on podcast Majority 54, previous Democratic candidate backed by Barack Obama for the 2020 presidential primary, author of Invisible Storm, a soldier's memoir of politics and PTSD, Sarah Schulman, AIDS historian, author of Let the Record Show, a political history of ACT UP New York City, and Robert Waldinger, MD, author of New York Times bestseller, The Good Life and Zen Priest. Composer-musician Dan Langa, currently faculty at Mount Holyoke College, who composed its theme music, joins Greenhouse in this engaging behind-the-scenes glimpse into how this politically relevant, artistically performative project is evolving, along with previews of her characteristic satirical perspectives on the trials and tribulations of becoming physically disabled herself mid-career when her neck was broken while faculty and capstone mentor at Commonwealth College Honors Division of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Greenhouse, an alumna of Sarah Lawrence College and Harvard Divinity School, was awarded the first endowed residential fellowship in performance art at Yaddo. She also received fellowships at the Malay Colony and the Jurassi Foundation. Her performance artwork has been archived at Franklin Furnace in NYC. For her exposure of an NRA mandate to arm women, Shooting in the Dark, awarded seven grants by the Northampton Arts Council, LLC. She also garnered two grants from the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund in performance poetry. The Jerome Fund for Performance Art was Artist in Residence in Directing at the Williamstown Theater Festival, honored by the New York State Council for the Arts for Outstanding Original Solo Performance, and was part of the 21 artists of every genre commissioned by the Cambridge Arts Council federally funded Arts on the Line to create performance arts events at MBTA Redline construction sites to ease passenger inconvenience. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Theater Week, Village Voice, San Francisco Weekly, Boston Phoenix, High Performance Quarterly, Woodstock Times, Portland Press Herald, Nantucket Beacon, 
St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Boston Herald, and numerous other magazines, media, radio, and television. Prior to her accomplished career in theater, video, writing, sound art, Greenhouse trained and performed as principal dancer in both ballet and modern dance companies in St. Louis, New York, and Cambridge. These are a few of her press quotes. Razor sharp observations, Bay Windows, Boston. Mordantly funny, swifty in humor, the New York Times. The thinking person's performance artist, hilarious and harrowing, the Boston Globe. Sally, why did you decide to present this preview of your project, Secret Lives of the Disabled, at a library? And why specifically at Forbes? I wanted to present at a library because in my personal history, it was in the category of what the late political philosopher Hannah Arendt describes as a natality experience. And she, of course, meant that everybody's primal story is the story of when we were born and how we were born. But it's also been referred to as a first time, the first time I. For me, the first time I went to a library is a memory that I remember so vividly. We lived in Hollywood, Florida, in between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, in a very middle-class neighborhood, and my dad wanted to be equidistant between a number of landmarks I learned decades later. He wanted the library to be within walking distance. One day, when I was three and a half and we'd been there a year, he said, we're going to the library. And he held my hand and my brothers who were older and always kind of wild uh, walking. He, they weren't exactly walking down the sidewalk. I don't know. They were wrestling each other. And he was holding my hand and talking to me. And what he, I remember him saying was the most important part of living in America is the public library in every community. And I didn't even know what a library was. So I had no idea what we were going to be doing there. And he said, it's so significant that everyone in America can get a library card and we will come to the library every other week. So then we got to the library, which was new. As we walked in, I looked up and I saw a kind of mezzanine and all I saw were books everywhere. And I loved books. And I loved the sound of poems. And I memorized them even before I could read. And I loved language and words. And I'd wanted to read so desperately that I just doggedly went after it until I was three and a half and I could read basic, easy chapter books with pictures. I looked up at my dad, who was trying to keep track of my older brothers who were horsing around. And I just said, when I grow up, I want to read all the books in the library. And it, there was just a broad smile on his face, the likes of which I had never seen before. And then he said, will you go to the children's books department now? And I'm going to try to find some books for your brothers. So I got to go to the children's books department and pick out any books I wanted. And I was reading them there. And then I don't know how long it was. He came back and he said, now you can check out six and take them home. I was so excited. And I had a library card. That's the answer to the first question. As a child, I was taught that the library, the local library, is essentially the jewel in the crown of every community. A library for me was a place where I always felt at home. And after he died, we moved back to St. Louis. And the first thing my mother did was she took us to the library. She said, I'm going to get each of you a library card. It's what your dad would have wanted. In high school, especially because there, the ballet studio was across from the library, I would go to the library before my ballet classes. As far as why I wanted to present this preview at a library and at Forbes Library specifically is that what I discovered about this part being the books are free, the music is free, and now, of course, DVDs are free, that it's free, that it's a welcoming space. After I became disabled, 
I realized that I wasn't going to be able to afford to buy books anymore. There was no building up of my books collection. And as you know, during the pandemic, everybody had their books behind them, right? But my books have been packed for over a decade. I found that the library for me was a refuge. I could no longer teach. I had been on the faculty, as you know, one of the five colleges. I was federally adjudicated as physically disabled. The way to keep my mind active was to get to the library and read. And it wasn't that you had all the books I was looking for. In fact, you rarely did at Forbes. And I remember Ben telling me once, oh, good. I'm always interested in the books you're requesting through interlibrary loan, which I had rarely used before. And I said, why are you interested? And Ben said, because you always request books that nobody else requests. (laughs) But you also had the newspapers, so I could read the Sunday Times, New York Times, and magazines. I was just really happiest when I was at the library. You also have a phenomenal staff, of which you are part, and you and Ben have been promoted, and the new person at that reference desk is incredible, Um, and the director is just magnificently friendly. Everybody there became sort of the mainstay of my week. And I think it's really important that people who become physically disabled have access to books and newspapers and magazines and music and movies and technology that's there because a lot of us can't afford that. You know, when you lose everything and you have to spend your life savings and you're living on subsidies, you might not be able to afford technology. And honestly, the best part at Forbes all of you who were on the staff. There's just no comparing. And I've been to a lot of libraries by now, and there's just nobody like the staff you have at Forbes, always being met with, how can I help you? The director actually making copies for me once. And there was somebody at the circulation desk who always asked me how my pain levels were and commented on the books that I was checking out. I didn't know what Canopy was until you told me and you signed me up. I didn't know how to do it so that I could watch films at home. I didn't know what Overdrive was until Ben told me about it last year. So you can read books if you have a laptop on your computer and I can hear them being read by the authors, which became very pertinent to to my project. Um, so, So that's really, I think, the answer kind of, sort of, to both your questions. How did you decide who your first podcast guests would be? I found each of them differently. I'm trying to think. Now there are so many. I, You know, we've backlogged interviews now. We've been interviewing for a while, and we're just working on audio engineering and e- editing some of them. Some of them are not edited. Some are. Let's see. One of them I heard on an interview with Matthew Desmond, and I intended to invite Matthew Desmond, who wrote Poverty by America. And this other man appeared with him on WBUR. So this man read an excerpt from his book, which is a novel that is set in Western Massachusetts. And it's about a man who falls off a roof while building a house. He marries a woman who went to Smith College. He's a carpenter, and he falls off the roof, becomes physically disabled, loses everything, including his wife and son, and ends up in Section 8, project-based subsidized housing. I felt it was like the story of what had happened to me. He read this excerpt, and his name is Andre Debuse III. I'm inviting him. It came down to scheduling a date for this guy, and I was, he was on a book tour. I thought, oh, he's not going to fit this in. And finally, I suggested my birthday. When he found out it was my birthday, he said yes. And the book is called Such Kindness. With Jason Kander, he had a website for veterans. I would really like to feature a veteran, and because you believe PTSD is physical as well as psychological, this would fit into my focus. Personally, he wrote, I'll do it. And one of them was a friend of mine when we were in our 20s in New York City, and that's Sarah Schulman. And she has since published 20 books. It was very radical to have all women doing women writing at that point in New York City. And she was really considerate, and she really liked my work, which was basically performed. She ended up publishing 20 books... I have not been published ever. I perform my work. And I just emailed her and said, hey, Sarah, do you want to be on? You have a recent book. It's a history of ACT UP in New York City. So she said, oh, sure. Another one was a coincidental book. 
And he's a Zen priest, but he also has a New York Times bestseller for something else. And some are coming up. There's a poet, Michael Blumenthal. None of his books, I think, are currently in print, but he's featured online at poets.com and Poets and Writers. He himself has a disability. Some of them have become disabled and some have not. Andre de Buse II, who died in 1999, I think it was, he was hit by a car on I-93. So he was a very highly renowned short story writer who won the MacArthur Genius Grant. And he's the father of Andre de Buse III. And it turns out that he was helping stranded motorists on I-93 and he was hit by a car. It was really serious. And half of one leg was amputated and the other one was he couldn't use anymore. And he had 34 broken bones. So he was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, which was 12 years. It became very much a, um, a story in itself and part of his essays and short stories post-accident. And I found this online. I found a book that I couldn't find through the library system, and it cost $97. So I did a Google search for the author, and I found her. And she called me back from Colorado, and she said, I will send you that book. I have an extra copy. And she said, I researched Andre de Buse II, all of his writings after the accident. I said, would you like to be on my podcast and talk about Andre de Buse II after the accident? He's, she said, well, I never met him. And then I said, that's okay. I'm looking for the Episcopal priest who was my friend who knew him and was in his short story workshop. So he's on the same podcast as the person who wrote the academic book on Andre de Buse II, his writings after his accident. So it was all just synchronicity happenstance? I don't know. Is there anyone you wanted to have as a guest who you couldn't get in touch with? Yes. She's a television producer and a screenwriter. She created a television show that I became addicted to. I was in a hard collar. It was really a terrifying time. And I became addicted to a series, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. And it was a Western, and I love Westerns, and I love that Dr. Quinn was from Boston. Her name was Michaela, but the town in Colorado Springs, the premise was they brought her to be their town doctor because they thought she was a man, and they thought her name was Mike. So, so when they, she got there and found, they found out she was a woman, well, that was a, you know really jarring for them, but they kept her, and it was based in, I think, 1875. So they called her Dr. Mike. I loved the show. The first five years after my neck was broken, I had to watch the show every day. <laughs> and, and it got me through. Beth Sullivan created it. There was a friend of hers who was in Hollywood, and I wrote to her and I said, listen, my neck was broken. I have spinal cord injury. I've survived by watching reruns of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Would you please give my telephone number and name to Beth Sullivan so that I can thank her? So about three weeks later, I get a phone call out of the blue and I answer the phone and this woman goes, hello, this is Beth Sullivan, the creator of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. <laughs> There's something I want to tell you. I'm paralyzed. I am a paraplegic. I became paralyzed in a catastrophic car accident. When I learned that you were in a catastrophic car accident, your neck was broken, you were initially a quadriplegic, and then somehow after the surgery, your paralysis reversed, I just had to call you. I couldn't get her for my podcast. I got her privately, but not publicly. So I understand that you structure these more like conversations. So how did you determine that would be your style of interviewing? I decided instead of doing a straightforward question approach, I need to do mutual conversation. I like to work collaboratively, spontaneously. I wanted there to be a feeling that you're sitting in a cafe and you're eavesdropping on some interesting conversation near you. The first posting is actually me doing a performance in New York City. Then you hear Andre Debuse III. He was so generous. It's everybody who loves to read. The fantasy of being able to tell the author what their book means to them. 
I find that if I'm vulnerable with the guest, they become more vulnerable with me. I ask randomly profound questions. The reason I call it Secret Lives of the Disabled, which you haven't asked, but it's not that these are kept secret. It's that because if you're not, if you've never been disabled, and you're not married to somebody disabled, or you don't have a close relative who became disabled, or you don't have a close friend who became disabled who remained your friend, you don't really know what it's like. And it's very different for people who were born with disabilities because they grow up with the disability. And somebody who was a guest on my program actually said to me later, privately, he said, I think it's very different for people like you. I think for people who become disabled after decades of being able-bodied, it is really a harsh reality that you face and it's harder for you. I'm not aiming to just reach other people like me. I, I want to reach other people like me because nobody gives an orientation on how to become disabled and lose everything. I'm wanting to reach Comcast representatives. I'm wanting to reach Amazon <laughs> delivery people. I'm wanting to reach like every agency that I have to deal with that doesn't understand that when they talk to people like me, we're not dumb. <laughs> when we say that we are disabled, they don't care. You know, <laughs> like if you go, I don't understand how to do that. I'm disabled. And, and it kind of brings me back to Forbes library that when I came to the reference desk at Forbes library and I said, I need your help how to find books in the system because my head hit the steering wheel when my neck was broken and I, I can't do these things online. Nobody thought that was weird. You were just right off the bat, just we're going to help you do that. And, and I was never judged. And I think what's really special about Forbes Library is that you are down the street from the VA hospital and when I discovered Jason Kander's book, I thought, this is fantastic. I want to have a veteran on. And that you draw, you know, veterans who are like Vietnam vets and veterans from other wars. That when I came to the library, although I was in a lot of pain, so I didn't often sit down to read. I would sit down to read the New York Times and magazines. All of you create a community there. And I think, you know, that for me, mitigated what can be just a never-ending onslaught of discriminatory treatment by people where I felt the indignity of, of how people were speaking to me, even looking at me, or when I asked for help. Two other libraries I went to that were absolutely the most negative experience I had in libraries ever because of my disability. Seriously. There was a documentary that everyone should see, and there was a couple that produced it, and their names are Michelle and Barack Obama, and it's called Crip Camp. It's about how the Americans with Disabilities Act got passed. So Crip Camp very important. And those are people who were born with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities. And they would not have been able to survive in their protest without people don't even know who they are now. But the Black Panthers came and they took care of them. And a lot of them were in wheelchairs and they were paralyzed. And the Black Panthers cooked for them and helped them get dressed. And they hung in there so that there is an ADA, even though it's very hard to find anybody to monitor and enforce it. But I, what I want to say is, this is what really gets to me. That was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary a few years ago. And that should have been a slam dunk. Here's the documentary that won that year. This is, now, it's, this is not funny. I have told people that. They think I'm making it up. And I just, now I'm going to say it publicly. The documentary that won, instead of Crip Camp, was about a man who becomes friends with an octopus. Everybody thinks I'm making that up. I am not. So I wanted to publicly say it in my preview of my project, Secret Lives of the Disabled. If you want to know why people who become disabled get so angry, we saw Crip Camp lose to a shorter documentary about a man who makes friends with an octopus.
Dan Langa is a Northampton-based composer, producer, and sound artist who holds a particular fascination with electroacoustic music and incorporating elements of the natural world into his work. Dan is the co-founder of Semantics Records, spelled C-M-N-T-X, a New York City-based and artist-run record label committed to supporting the music and careers of artists with distinct multifaceted practices. He is also a co-founder of The Present Kairos, a multimedia project exploring language and the kaleidoscope core of individual words. He earned his BA in music from Amherst College, graduating magna cum laude with the highest departmental honors and received his master's degree in music theory and composition from New York University. He is currently a visiting lecturer in music at Mount Holyoke College and a digital music instructor at Amherst College. Before musician and composer Dan Langa speaks about how he composed his original theme music for Secret Lives of the Disabled, I'd like to play that theme for you. After he speaks, you will be able to see video and audio excerpts from the first guest on the podcast, Andre the III, author of the new novel, Such Kindness. What needed to be found was the overall sound palette and the overall aesthetic of the theme music for this podcast. Sally then sent me a few clips of performances that she had done, past performances, and clips that would be included in the podcast. And I was able to draw the aesthetic and tone of the theme music from these. In all these examples and these clips that Sally sent me, I was struck by the duality and kind of balance between more tragic and darker tones, both um, in the subject matter and sort of in the delivery, and balanced with more of a sense of humor um, and a lightness to uh, parts of her work. And I really enjoyed listening to how she was able to sort of straddle the line between these two modes and I felt like the theme music also needed to find this balance. In most of my work I like using source material and I usually build um, actual instruments from this source material like field recordings and this becomes the palette and the sound world for a piece and in some ways this is the same where this source material is her performances and these clips. Um, But instead of using these as actual instruments, it became the lens that I was looking through to find other instruments and other sounds for the theme music. The sound palette became a collection of heavier chords and on top of these heavier chords, some sort of whimsical and lighter sounds. The heavier chords plot along, and as the theme develops, the whimsical, lighter sounds come in. There is also the fact that the title, Secret Lives of the Disabled, just inherently has a sense of mystery to it. So I felt like the theme music needed to have some level of mystery associated with it. I didn't want to be too on the nose about this, but I definitely felt like it was important to include this in the overall uh, general tone of the music. So altogether, darker, heavier chords, along with lighter, more whimsical sounds that represent the kind of balance between tragedy and humor, as well as adding in a sense of mystery is how we found the overall aesthetic palette for the theme music for the podcast. So one day I was driving by subsidized housing in the next door. You know, I've got a loved one who lives in subsidized housing. I have another loved one who lives in a wheelchair and she's half paralyzed. And I have people in my life 
um, whose lives are much harder than mine. Mine is not hard. Mine is rich and challenging, but it's not, not like theirs. Theirs is full of suffering. And my question was, well, what if I fell off a roof? What if, what if my writing life never took off and I was still in my 60s making a living? I still have a truck. I have tools. I can still build stuff. But what if, it ha- what if I still had a mortgage and kids to raise and my way of making a living was gone? And what if I lost everything? And so for me, the question, Sally, is always, what if? What if I was this kind of person? What if I was in this kind of situation? And so, then- Andre, you're actually much more in touch with the possibility of how fragile our lives and our bodies are. I, I agree with you. I, I, maybe to a hypervigilant extent, I have never taken my mortality for granted. I mean, take, I know about my mortality. I've never taken being alive for granted. I've never taken that I can see or hear or move. And I don't know where this came from. It might have come from just a, a difficult start in life, although there are a lot more difficult starts in life around the world every day. But I, I agree with you. I, you know, I am did, Didn't your brother walking. fall off of a roof and break his neck? He did. My brother fell off a roof and broke his neck, and he's still suffering from it 40 years later. Oh, he and I can commiserate. Uh, yeah, you can. And he's in he's also in, been in chronic pain. He's still in, he's in chronic pain now. Um you know, my feeling is in you know, it's a biblical cliche, but there but for the grace of God go I every day. Let's take a time out because this is an incredibly crucial point that you've raised with this word that you invented, mm. abundance, because this project, Secret Lives of the Disabled, addresses the particular predicament of becoming physically disabled in America, which drives most people into the predicament that Tom Lowe has ended up in, which is a Section 8 project-based subsidized housing. And he is in chronic pain this is a culture that's terrified of death. You know, when, when watch how quickly people run away when someone's dying, you know, you thought you had friends and the, it, you know, you got the one or two heroes and then the rest are all gone. What is this about? I still think that this is a culture, America, that divides its citizens into winners or losers. And what's a winner? Well, money, status, prestige, mainly money, power. And, and who are the losers? Those who don't have any of the above. And so we get into issues of race and misogyny and patriarchy and all that, of course. But I'm convinced that the reason people, not convinced, that I feel very strongly that one reason why people aren't visiting you, aren't, aren't visiting my character, Tom Lowe, and subsidized housing, they're afraid to catch it. it it's as if uh, poverty is, is contagious, and I can't go near it. It'll happen to me. Or disability. Or they disability. didn't like seeing me in yeah. a hard collar. All of that, and that, and that, what will happen is I will, I will fall off my mountaintop I've worked so hard to get to, or that I was born into, and then I'll be a nothing because this is a culture that throws away anyone who's not uh, successful. And so I, I, th- I think we live in a toxic culture that is the opposite of compassionate and loving. That's it, that I am not suggesting that people every day in this country don't get up with. And this is why I think Such Kindness is such an important book of the moment right now. He makes his son his own little drug runner. And that was just one of the issues that estranged Tom from his family. So he's working his way back. You know, your question makes me almost cry because, you know, in that photograph of me and my old man, it's very perceptive to have noticed a wheelchair. Nobody notices that. I was I happened to be at his house doing some carpentry work and when the picture is being taken and for an essay my father wrote about his two sons, me and my brother carrying him when he needed to be carried. And uh the photographer Michelle said, Would you mind how do you do it? And I squatted. I said, Well I squat here and he he wraps his arms and legs around my back and I stand up and piggyback and carry him. And that's what I was, I was just beginning to stand. And I did stand and I walked a few feet with him to show Michelle, the photographer. Um, You know, when that photograph came out, it felt kind of claustrophobic. I was still trying to separate from my father, both personally and professionally. And I was stuck with the same name with that clunky three on it. And 
And but you know, now my dad's been gone twenty four and a half years, and I treasure that photograph. It hangs prominently on my own wall. Uh, it's an astonishing portrait because, of you know, of each of you. It. Yes, thank you. I, I want to say something too, though, about disability. You know, you talk about one of the things I I witnessed with my own father in a wheelchair is the way people would talk to him. Just because he's in a wheelchair, we'd wheel into a restaurant. This is a award-winning writer. MacArthur award-winning, right. Yeah, Genius MacArthur, Grant. Considered to be one of the finest short story writers America has ever produced. And the maitre d' will look at me and say, does he want to sit near the window? Totally, said, totally. Ask him. Andre, Andre. Said, Man, ask him. So you're in solitary confinement for a week, and and all you can have are the poems of three poets. Who would they be? One would be Marie Howe. One would be Jane Kenyon. Yes. And then it's either Sharon Olds oh or God. or Mark Doty. Oh or, my God! They were all the poets that or, I. Had. Or Stephen Dunn. Oh my God. Or Theodore you keep poets. Wait a minute. Well, how can you name so many poets? I only asked for three. Golly, I read poetry every morning and I have for 40 years. What? I have over a thousand volumes of poetry in my writing cave. Before I teach Whoa. UMass School, before every class, I read a poem to my students. Sometimes three or four times we pass the poetry pipe. and they, I give them like four collections of poems. They go around and they read a poem. We never talk about it. It's just like a good song on the radio. I'm a poetry reading prose writer. Oh, my God. I was reading to make it through subsidized housing. Jean Valentine, Marie Mm. Howe, Elizabeth Bishop, Mm. Mark Doty. This game Botticelli, like geeky intellectuals played it. And what you do is you you drink Brandy Alexander's and (laughs) um, and you're too young. to Somebody has to get it, you know, and you're too young to buy it yourself. And the basic Botticelli is it's just like a game of 20 questions and you become a character and then people are allowed to ask you yes or no questions. Okay, Mm -hmm. and then you have to guess who they are, like Mm -hmm. a person who's, you know, a historical person or a poet you know, or a writer or an artist. Okay. Now there's another version of this game, which I'm going to play with you to end our interview. It's called Freudian Botticelli. (laughs) Now, now Andre, I think you're capable of this. Freudian Botticelli is very complex and um, you've got the Brandy Alexanders. You have to have at least two. Okay. Maybe you would need three. I only need two, (laughs) but I'm very tiny. So So you've got, you've had your Brandy Alexanders and you become your character. So for example, I'm, you know, like you could be, um, let's say you're Oscar Wilde, but nobody knows that. And so you would be asked questions like, okay, if you went to a costume ball, Mm. would you be wearing um, a cape? Oscar Wilde always wore a cape, you know, Mm. Um, or would you, would you bring a, a picture frame and put it around, you know, if we got closer to the picture of Dorian Gray, that he was the author of that, would you hold a picture frame up and appear in the center of it? So you, the questions get further and further art. They're very far out questions, right? I'm hmm. going to pose a question like that to you. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Let me finish you, my third Brandy Alexander. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, your third Brandy Alexander. And you win, by the way, absolutely nothing whatsoever. <laughs> Good. Um. Okay, so you are Tom Lowe. And in some ways, you've already told us that you are Tom Lowe. You could be Tom Lowe. Um, You have an hour to live. You can make one telephone call. And because I know you don't have a phone, I'm going to supply my landline. I have a landline. I do not own an iPhone, a smartphone. (laughs) The person who broke my neck was on her cell phone at the time. That might be part of it. I don't text. I don't want, Sally, you know, I don't participate. I, I have never sent a text. I have never been on social media. Oh, I seriously? Talk. Oh. I've never seen an emoji or a meme. I own a flip phone. I am never going to get, I call Oh, them. an author after my own heart. Okay. So, okay. So you are Tom Lowe. I will supply you with a landline. Okay. It doesn't have a rotary dial. You have to punch it, but Okay. You have one telephone call that you can make in the hour that you have left to live. Who would you call and what would you say to them? 
To hear the answers to those questions, join me at secretlivesofthedisabled.com. Sally, that was such a joy. I love your mind.